in discipleship class, I believe we're in 15. Uh, I lost track of the numbers. But now we're going to talk about the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Christ and his ascension. And his ascension. Uh, homework, there will be no homework actually tonight. So you guys get a bonus. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you look at your paper, so we can't upload the papers online. So I apologize to my viewers. Uh, but to my members here, you guys got the paper, and then you can write notes all over it. So let's talk about the resurrection of Christ. Let's first talk about the evidences of the resurrection. Evidences of the resurrection. So the evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it can be first found with the number of witnesses. The number of witnesses. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, verses 6. Verse 6. First Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll look at verse 6. So let's first talk about the evidences of the resurrection. We can first base it off on the number of witnesses. If you go in front of court and you have two or three eyewitnesses, that's pretty good evidence. But if you have 500, that's more than enough evidence. So why do we believe Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead? The evidence is because you got over 500 eyewitnesses. That's more than enough. Verse 6, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. You'll also notice right here that it's not only 500 witnesses, but there are written testimonies as well, written testimonies. So there are Matthew to John, Matthew to John, as well as 1 Peter through Jude, 1 Peter through Jude. So you'll notice right here that you've got numerous books written by these authors who testified they saw Jesus, as well as 500 eyewitnesses. So you've got written testimony as well as eyewitness testimony. That's more than enough. The second one is the conviction of wrong skeptics. Conviction of skeptics. So the skeptics, they got converted. Who would be the last ones to believe in the resurrection? So who, who are skeptical. So if there's an atheist who believed in it, then you know that it must be true. Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 15, it talks about two people who walked the road to Emmaus. They were skeptical of the resurrection. And then they believed. You also have John chapter 20, verses 25 through 29. Thomas was a doubter, but he believed the resurrection. Philippians chapter 3, verses Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 7 as well. Skeptics believed in it. The third thing is the empty tomb. The empty tomb. Why isn't Jesus dead? Simple. Look at his grave. He's not there. For he is not here, he is risen. Matthew chapter 28, verse 6. That's the proof text. In fact, go to findagrave.com. If you go to findagrave.com, they will have the burial sites of Mohammed, Buddha, and the popes. But you type down Jesus, it's not there. It's not there. All right, the fourth thing is that they risked everything. They risked everything upon a living Savior. So because of the risks that they were willing to take, it shows that, you know, why are they willing to sacrifice, risk everything on a made-up being who raised himself from the dead? Unless it's true. Unless it's true, then they would believe in that. A passage for that is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 16 through 19. Paul said that everything that we practice believe in, why do we come to church? Why do we sing hymns? Why do we fellowship? together. The reason why is because of a living Savior. And if he's not resurrected, we would not even be here today. you got to understand. But no Muslim, Buddhist, or Confucianist can make such a bet where find the body of Jesus. That's our bet. Find the body of Jesus, and then we'll renounce our Christianity. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. He betted it. He risked. Muslim, Confucianist, Buddhist, they can't make such a bet. You know why? Because they know that their founders of their religions are dead. 
the explanations of the resurrection. Now, here's the important thing that you've got to tackle, the explanations of the resurrection. So there's going to be skeptics out there. There's going to be skeptics who are going to try to explain away the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One of them is the infamous myth theory. But this one is pretty much not true now because of historical records. If you look at your page, look at the back page, the final page, you'll see too many historical evidences where this resurrection is not a myth. You can't just say it's a made-up myth. There's a manuscript dated at A.D. 66. I think that's been disproven now because Dan Wallace, who's an anti-KJV advocate, he used this manuscript and hyped up about it, but it turned out to be fake, I think. So you can cross that one out, I guess. But aside from that one, you got numerous papyrus manuscripts. You got Old Latin and Old Syriac versions. You got New Testament quotations from Polycarp, who was born at A.D. 69. Pella, born at A.D. 80. Irenaeus, born 1st century, Tertullian, born 1st century, and Clement of Alexandria, born 1st century. They support the dates of the New Testament canon, the New Testament books of the Bible that testified of the resurrection, right? They supported the New Testament canon around the time of Christ. There are too many evidences for that. The sources to prove it uh, can be found at Eyewitness to Jesus by Karsten P. Theed and Matthew D. Ancona uh, at pages 124 to 125, Edward F. Hills at Believing Bible Study, pages 180 to 181, H.S. Miller's book, Bibli <coughs> Biblical Introduction, pages 132 to 133. Dr. William F. Albright from John Hopkins University writes, after exhaustive historical and archaeological research, quote, we can already say emphatically that there is no longer any solid basis for dating any book of the New Testament after about A.D. 80. Wow. Two full generations before the date between 130 and 150, given by the more radical New Testament critics of today. The book is Recent Discoveries in Bible Lands, page 136. Not only that, a non-Christian historian named Josephus, who was born at A.D. 37, recorded, quote, Now there was about this time Jesus a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. For he was a doer of wonderful works, uh, yada, 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 let's skip it right here. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. Jewish Antiquities, 18.3.3. So you notice right here that there are historical records that prove that there is historical claim of people who said that Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead. So now it is an undoubtable fact. There are witnesses. There are people who claim Jesus resurrected. So let's go to the other explanations for the resurrection. Okay, it's not a myth, but as the critics will argue, number two is, let's see right here, the myth story. Here's the crazy one, hallucination theory, the hallucination theory. So in other words, uh, they were hallucinating. They didn't really see Jesus Christ resurrected. Why do they say that? Because they're running out of options. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest evidence of Christianity against all religions. So Bible is the foundation, but the next evidence is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But this is disproven when we look at the books of, let's see right here, Matthew chapter 28 verse 9, as well as 1 John 1, 1. So you'll notice right here at Matthew 28, 9 and 1 John 1, 1, that they were able to touch him and handle him. So it shows that it cannot be a hallucination because they were able to touch him and handle him. But not only that, you can't get a group of people who share the same hallucination, especially 500 eyewitnesses. That doesn't really work. Now for the myth theory, I forgot to give a verse here, but the verse is Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Why does Acts 1-3 prove it's not a myth? Because it says, after many infallible proofs. Now, the modern Bibles will change it to convincing proofs. 
not infallible. Ooh, I guess big difference right there. That's right. Now, the thing is, is that in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, another important note is this, is that to create a myth, it takes at least a number of generations to form one. It can't be so close within the first century. So because of that, those historical evidences within that first century is enough to debunk the myth theory. A myth cannot be formed until it takes a number of generations. That's a basic in mythology class that I even took at higher education class. And you all know that I went to Berkeley. So hallucination theory, myth theory is debunked. The third one is the fraud theory, the fraud theory. So there's, we're running out of space here, so I'll move it over here, the fraud theory. Now the fraud theory is that basically that they were lying. But if they were really lying, you gotta realize this, these people were tortured torn apart by lions, burnt alive. They witnessed their own loved ones dying, and they were crucified while they believed that their religion was a lie. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, right? If you and I are going to make up a story that Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead, if we're going to make up a story like that, and then the federal agents tortured you and I while knowing, while we knew in our head that it was a lie, and your loved one was being tortured, there's no way that you and I would die and get tortured for that, for something so ridiculous like that, especially when you got hundreds of Christians dying, and they were forced to deny. They were forced to become an atheist of the resurrection. Didn't you know that? They said, deny that you ever saw Jesus resurrected. But they say, I cannot deny Jesus. And they were tortured. How about that? So this definitely disproves the fraud theory. The, uh, the other one is the swoon theory. Yeah, believe it or not, they believe that Jesus Christ, he didn't really die. He just swooned on the cross, and the cool air of the tomb revived him. <laughs> but that is ridiculous, because if you look at these verses right here, which we won't turn to, but if you look at John 19.34, every last drop of blood was gone. John 19.40, spices on his body were poisonous, you got to understand. The stone couldn't be rolled away by one man at Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, and it was guarded sure for certain by armed Roman soldiers. Matthew chapter 27, verse 62 through 66. So the swoon theory is definitely ridiculous. There's no, one, no way people would believe in that. The other one is the stolen body theory. The stolen body theory. So in other words, the disciples came and and they stole the body of Jesus. But you got to understand this. No robber in his or her right mind would steal something while leaving the bandages unwrapped with the head cloth lying really straight while there's armed soldiers around. There's no way. You ever seen them go to a gift package and they unwrap it carefully, they take the package and then they wrap the package back and stuff like that with what, armed soldiers running around? No. <laughs> Besides, you got over 500 witnesses who saw him at 1 Corinthians 15, 6. So this thing doesn't work. How can they successfully steal that way? There's no way they can successfully steal that way. The other one is the ghost theory. Now, what is that? They there are religions who teach that people only saw his ghost, not his body. At Luke chapter 24, verse 39 and 43, Jesus said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as he see me have. So he proved right there that you're not seeing a ghost, that what you're seeing is flesh right here. And they touched him, you got to understand. Jehovah Witnesses, I don't know if they still believe it, but they deny the resurrection of Jesus and claim they only saw his spirit. So you ask them that, if they believe in that or not. I don't know if they know that. Some of the Jehovah Witnesses know that. Or they change their beliefs. The seventh one is the excavation theory. In other words, they did find the body of Jesus. What? Really? Yeah. Didn't you watch the Da Vinci Code? It's very biblical. You know, it matches up with the King James Bible perfectly. Those guys know what they're talking about. <laughs> it's because of ridiculous nonsense like that, garbage like that. That's why they think that they found the body of Jesus. So they recently discovered the body with the name Jesus on an ossuary. An ossuary is the remains of the dead person. But you got to realize this. Just because a name called Jesus 
is labeled on some kind of ossuary does not prove that it's him. Do you know how many Jesuses you can find in the tombstones of America and around the world? <laughs> Just because you see one name, Jesus, it doesn't make a difference. By the way, there are many people in the Bible who had that name. If you look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 13. In Acts 7 verse 45, excuse me, Acts 7 45, you'll notice right there that Jesus is named here, but it's not the same Jesus who is God. This is Jesus who took the Israelites into the promised land at the book of Acts chapter 7. All right, now let's talk about his resurrected body. Now, the resurrected body of Jesus Christ, what does it look like right now? Some of you are probably wondering, what kind of body does Jesus have right now in heaven? Well, guess what? You're going to have the exact same body like Jesus. Didn't you know that? You might, <clears throat> you might say, no, I don't believe it, Pastor. Well, the Bible says you exactly will have the same resurrected body like Jesus Christ. That is something unfathomable. That is an incredible blessing. So what is Jesus' resurrected body like? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It's definitely going to be better than Superman. It's going to be better than Michael the Archangel. It's going to be better than all kinds of fictional superheroes that you've heard in stories. You're going to get the body of God manifest in the flesh. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? That's going to be something right there. Okay, so we're going to look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 39. Luke chapter 24, and we will read verse 39. So, his resurrected body, it first has flesh and bones. Flesh and bones. That's founded at Luke chapter 24 and verse 39. You notice it doesn't say flesh and blood, right? It said flesh and bones. Do you know why? The blood, Jesus' body does not have blood in him. Usually the phrase is flesh and blood, flesh and blood, flesh and blood. You'll see that throughout the Bible. But this verse is flesh and bones, meaning that Jesus Christ's body has no blood. Another one is that it's a glorious body, glorious body. That can be found at Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Verse 21. Another thing is that it's an immortal body. So in other words, that body will never die. It will never die. Romans chapter 6 and verse 9. Another thing about the resurrected body of Jesus is that it's a spiritual body. I bet you you never realize that. The reason why is because the spirit and flesh will combine together. Because you're going to have a new kind of flesh, a transformed flesh. That's found at 1 Corinthians 15 verses 44 through 45, and verse 47. Another thing is that it can phase through objects. Now, that's wild, right? You can actually go through objects with this body. And the evidence is found at, you can turn over there right now. We'll turn over there now. It's John chapter 20, verse 19. John chapter 20, verse 19. Notice how Jesus Christ appeared to the disciples right here. He just popped out of nowhere. And they closed the door. They kept it shut. But he went right through it. He just came there. Look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And we will read verse 19. Verse 19. Notice what the word of God says right here. Hmm, let me turn over this page real quickly. Then being the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So notice right here that with the door shut, he just came to them. So it shows right here he's got a fantastic body that just can pop out of nowhere, face through objects. The best thing is that, do you know what Jesus', Jesus resurrected body looks like? It's likened to the body of Christians. Now, obviously not our current bodies today, but our resurrected bodies at the rapture. That's what Jesus' body will look like. So, in other words, that means that when you get resurrected and raptured, you're going to have the same body like Jesus Christ. Now, that should be a blessing. You, you should be telling yourself, man, how unworthy am I to get such a big blessing like that? I don't know why the Lord would do it for a wretched sinner like me. 
the results of his resurrection now. So let's now talk about the results of his resurrection. What are the results of his resurrection? What happened? It proves the existence of God. It proves the existence of God. That's found at Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you look at Romans 10, 9, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you'll notice right here that it says that when you confess the Lord Jesus, believe that God raised him from the dead. So notice right here, believe God raised him from the dead. So if you believe the raising, the resurrection, you have to believe in the person who did the raising for you, God. So the resurrection proves the existence of God. Not only that, it proves the deity of Jesus Christ. It proves the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. There are so many things online where it says that Jesus is not God. But if you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 4, why don't you turn over there? Go to Romans chapter 1, verse 4. His resurrection proves that Jesus is not just a normal human being, but that he is truly deity. We're going to look at Romans chapter 1, and we will read verse 4. Romans chapter 1, and we will read verse 4. Notice right here the Bible says, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, notice, by the resurrection from the dead. So because of that resurrection from the dead, he is declared to be the Son of God. Muslims do not believe Jesus is the Son of God. Well, his resurrection proves that he is the Son of God. Another thing is, it means salvation is an accomplished fact. Salvation is an accomplished fact. It's completed. It is done. That's what his resurrection resulted with. Man, that's a blessing. At Romans chapter 5, verse 10, it shows right here that God's resurrection completed our salvation. Thus, mankind does not have to go through animal sacrifices for thousands of years and centuries like they did back then. They don't have to wait for thousands of years for their Messiah. Salvation was completed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Another thing is that it guarantees that everyone will be resurrected. Wow, that's a blessing. It proves that if Jesus Christ resurrected, then all of us will be resurrected. That's a matter of fact. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 16. Paul says right there, the reason why we believe in the resurrection of the dead is because Christ raised himself from the dead. Another thing is that it has us walking in newness of life. Do you know why you can live your life as a saved, Bible-believing Christian? You don't have to go back to the old ways where you were drinking, smoking, living like the devil. You can now have the opportunity to live in holiness, serving God the way you should. Why? Because of his resurrection, bless God. Romans 6, 4. To conquer the oldness of life. And to have the newness of life is because of the power of the resurrection. It prepares him to fulfill his next promise. So that's number six. It prepares him to fulfill his next promise. And that's a blessing. Go to John 14, 3. John 14, 3. What's that next promise, Pastor? Oh, look at this, my friend. That's why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is absolutely salient. You see all these results that happen. It changed your life and my life forever. Yeah, you know why Jesus Christ can prepare us a mansion in heaven? Because he's not dead. He's alive. Look at John chapter 14. And we will read verse 3. John 14 verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, see that? He's preparing a place for us. I will, <clears throat> I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He's standing as if he's alive. He is not dead. So our Jesus Christ, he is not in the grave with Buddha and Mohammed. He is alive and up in heaven. He is not sharing some compartment in hell like Buddha and Mohammed are doing right now. Because those founders of those religions cannot save a single soul from hell. 
Only our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can. Now let's talk about his ascension. Let's talk about the ascension of Jesus Christ. So uh, surprisingly, it seems like I covered a lot of ground at a short amount of time. So we can take some time to look through some verses a little more. Let's look at Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Now obviously we're not going to look at all the verses from here. But uh, I'm going to look at the more salient areas. So let's talk about the ascension of Jesus Christ. The ascension of Jesus Christ. So the ascension of Jesus Christ, ascend, meaning he went up. So our Jesus Christ is not only resurrected, he had to go up to heaven. He ascended. Now, there are people who heard about Jesus Christ being resurrected from the dead, but they don't know too much about his ascension. What did Jesus do after his resurrection? You ever thought about that? After he raised himself from the dead, what did he do? Um, how did he ascend up into heaven? What's the purpose of his ascension? Why are you teaching about his ascension, Pastor? What's so important about that? Well, I'll show you some verses why it's important. Let's look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. Acts chapter 1. And we will read verse 3. Let's talk about the, the story of his ascension. The first thing is that he spent 40 days on earth after his resurrection to prove that he's alive. And he also prepared them for his teaching. So he was on earth 40 days. So you got to know that. When Jesus resurrected, he didn't immediately ascend. He was on earth for 40 days. Why? To prove his, that he's alive... And not only to prove that he's alive, but he also had to teach his disciples. That way, his disciples can continue to minister to the church and know how to start a church. It's like if I'm going to leave Sean, Tom, and some of the laborers in my church, I'm not just going to leave immediately. I'm going to probably take some time to teach them to take care of a church if I'm going to be gone forever. <laughs> now, God forbid that would happen, eh? God forbid that would happen. Now let's look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 9 through 11. Oh, I said Acts 1, 3, so we didn't read that yet. I apologize. Let's read that first. It says, to whom also he showed himself alive. See that one, after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days. See, he was there 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. See, he was teaching them as well. So a second thing is that he went up to heaven on a cloud, bodily and visibly. So Jesus Christ visibly went up on a cloud. So there was a cloud that came down, and then he got up on the cloud, and then he flew back up. That's Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. If you look at that passage, you know that he ascended up on a cloud. Let's read that. The verse says, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. And then you'll notice as you read verse 10 and 11, uh, there are two shining ones that actually told them that Jesus Christ, that he's going to come down in like manner, bodily and visibly. Man, that's going to be quite a sight one day. Amen. He ascended to sit on the right hand of the Father. So where Jesus Christ is right now is that he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. That can be found at Acts, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. Now, there are some who would say that, oh, when God, Jesus was sitting at the right hand of the Father, it was only figurative. It wasn't literal. Uh, no, because turn to Acts 7, 56. Acts chapter 7, verse 56. You'll notice that it was a literal geographic location. I don't think Stephen was being figurative right here. He saw him at a particular location. Look at the book of Acts chapter 7, and we will read verse 56. Notice the word of God reads, And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing where? On the right hand of God. The right hand of God. So you see that? He was seeing it at a geographic lo location. Another thing concerning about his ascension 
is the prophecies. So you got to understand that with Jesus Christ, when he ascended, there were prophecies in the Old Testament. This is utmost proof that Jesus has to be the Messiah because one, they saw his resurrection. Two, you can't see him anywhere or his lifetime's recorded. He disappeared out of nowhere. So he ascended. So uh, there were prophecies of his ascension. Here are the verses to prove his ascension. It's, there are so many Old Testament passages. It's Psalms chapter 68, verse 18. The other Old Testament passage is Psalms 110, and then verse 1. Another passage is Luke chapter 9, and verse 51. Another passage is John chapter 6, and then verse 62. Another passage is John chapter 14 and verse 28. Another passage is John chapter 20, verse 17. You can't deny Jesus as being the Old Testament or the Messiah at all. He's definitely the Messiah because he had to fulfill all this. He had to fulfill a lot of prophecies in the Bible. Now, the importance of his ascension. Now, this one you're going to get a blessing. The importance of his ascension. Why is his ascension so important? The reason why his ascension is very salient and his ascension is very important is because it relates to you, all the blessings of God of what he did to you in your life. The Holy Ghost, he comes upon believers. That's the one thing. So one, the Holy Ghost is able to enter the believers. You got to realize this, the Holy Ghost can't come on us unless Jesus Christ goes up first. That's what he said. That's found at John chapter 16 and verse 7. The second thing about his ascension is that Christ is preparing mansions for believers. So you got to understand this. The reason why he had to ascend is because he's right now building my mansion up in heaven so that once I die, he can have it nice and cozy and all set for me. That's why he had to ascend, because he's preparing your mansion. If you don't want him to ascend, how can he prepare the mansion for you? The other thing is that so that the disciples can do greater works. Man, that's an incredible blessing. You know why the disciples were able to raise dead people back to life, do miracles? It's because Jesus Christ ascended up to heaven. Amen. Why? Because Jesus is no longer doing the greater works himself. He gave that opportunity upon the New Testament church with his disciples, with his disciples, so that they can do greater works. And that's found at John chapter 14, verse 12. Now, for signs, for signs, the disciples did greater works. But the signs are faded and they are no longer applicable for us today. Amen. However, this does not mean that God is not working in us still. He is still working in us within a powerful, mighty way. It's not through signs alone you got to understand God works through. People limit the power of God only through signs. And when we criticize the charismatic movement and say signs are no longer available, there are emotional people out there that would cry and throw a fit that, oh, you can't do that. I've seen God's power work in my life. That's right. We don't deny his answers to prayer, his working in your life, but we sure do deny signs. Yep. Signs is scriptural in the Bible. God does no longer do signs anymore. I'm not going to get into that one. You all know the verses for that. The next one is so that the Father can be glorified. Why did Jesus go up? Simple, so that the Father can be glorified. Many things we don't understand in life, why God does things, he does things to you where you might see it as unfair. But you got to understand this. The simple answer to basically everything is that it glorifies the Father, period. You shouldn't have any other questions after that. The fifth one is that because Christ became prince and savior. He became prince and savior. If he stayed on the earth, then all he can do is just continually do his work as a humble lowly Jesus, meek and mild, like he did in his ministry. But he had to be exalted, raised up. So that's why he had to ascend. The other thing that Jesus Christ did was that he gave gifts to men. Man, that's a blessing. Didn't you know that right now you and I have gifts that we can use for the glory of God? 
Christ no longer has to do the work himself. That's why he ascended. He gifted it to you to take care of his ministry, his work. And it's been going on for 2,000 years. They didn't wipe us out yet. And I'm going to tell you something. The church can fall into apostasy, but I'm going to tell you something. Even though the church falls into apostasy, you'll never wipe out the movement of Jesus Christ. It'll march on. God's going to rapture somebody. God's going to rapture somebody. The seventh thing is that Christ had to demonstrate that sins were completely purged. Sins were completely purged. That's why he had to ascend. Why? So that he can show himself to the Father. Show himself to the Father that, hey, sins are completely purged and forgiven. That's found at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Hebrews 1, 3. I apologize. I did not give the verses for these other ones. So let me go through it briefly. For number 6, it was Ephesians 4, verse 8. And then verse 11 shows the gifts. If you look at Acts chapter 5, verse 31, for number 5. And then for number 4, look at John chapter 17, verse 1. And then for number 3, look at John chapter 14, verse 12. And then I'm not sure if I showed you 2 or 1, but just in case, number 2 would be John chapter 14, verse 2 through 3. And then number 1 would be John chapter 16 and verse 7. Now let's look at... Uh, number eight right here, Christ, why does he intercede for us? He's able to intercede for us as our high priest because of his ascension. Why did he ascend up to heaven? So that he can intercede on my behalf whenever I mess up. So I thank God that Jesus is up there to take care of my problems for me as my high priest. Praise the Lord. That's found at Hebrews 9, verse 24. 9, verse 24. Hebrews 7, 25. 7, 25. And chapter 8, verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1. Another thing, this is a blessing. See, his ascension is an important doctrine. Some people think, oh, basic doctrine. I know, I know. No, you don't know. Because if you did know, you'd be shouting and running the aisles by now. His ascension did all this for you and I. That's a blessing, man. Look at all this. Look at all this. Another thing is that Jesus Christ... uh, He ascended so that we can come boldly before God in prayer. You know why you can become bold in front of God in prayer? Because he's ascended. He's up there to hear your behalf. Man, the ascension of Christ, you can just preach a sermon on this. You can just preach a sermon on this. You know, when our revival happens, you know, I don't have to prepare a sermon. All I can do is just... Okay, we're going to talk about the ascension of Christ. Oh, the ascension, I already know that kind of stuff. And then, boy, I can go on an hour on that, and you won't stay stuck in your seat when I get preaching on the ascension. Okay, let's talk about the tenth one. The tenth reason the ascension is so important is because we can look in Christ in heaven as our goal when we keep looking up not down here on this world. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. That's why his ascension is so important. Because in Hebrews 12, verse 2, it shows that we keep looking unto Jesus. He's up there. So we're heavenly minded, not earthly minded. If we see Jesus down here with the house, wife and children, rich life, then that would (laughs) encourage us to be worldly minded. We don't teach that kind of nonsense like Mormons and Gnostics do. Number 11, we are sitting together with Christ in heaven. Woo, reservation made. I got a resurrection, uh, reservation, reservation with Christ up in heaven. You know why? Because he ascended. That's why I know I have a reservation up there. Well, how do you know you got a reserva- reservation up there? Simple, because Christ is up there sitting on my seat right now and saying, this seat's taken. That's Get out of here. Amen. Lucifer, he can say, oh, I'll ascend above the heights of the cloud. I'm going to sit over there. And God, can you imagine Jesus Christ saying, get out of there. That's Gene Kim's spot right there. Amen. Amen. Oh, man. I, that, man, I just feel like preaching a revival now. I, uh, I might use that as an illustration one day, maybe. Okay, the other one is that uh, Christ can fill all things. We're at number 12, folks. Number 12. His ascension is important so that he can fill everything in this universe. That's why you will never fear because Christ is always near. He's everywhere. 
I mean, if he didn't ascend, he would be limited in his human body, human state here on this earth. Yep, right. The powers of Christ recognize the authority of Christ. That's number 13. You know why Jesus Christ has to ascend up there? Because Pilate, Herod, and the people, they're not going to acknowledge Jesus Christ down here. Yep. But you know what? Because Jesus Christ is up there, there is no power on this earth that can, that can work against our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that can dismantle and degrade his authority. That's, right, exactly. That's why the ascension of Christ is so important. That's found at 1 Peter 3, 22. 1 Peter 3, 22. And then for number 12 is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. And then uh, number 11 will be Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. Thus we include the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. We serve a powerful and an awesome God. Man, thank God for his resurrection and for his ascension. You hear a lot of good preaching about the resurrection of Christ. But what about his ascension? Maybe you can start one right now. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll dismiss uh, tonight's discipleship with your blessing and bless the next hours of the services. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.